welcome to the fourth international conference on youth and migration under the theme African Youth and Migration. The Honorable State Minister for Relief, Disaster Preparedness and Refugees, the President of the International Institute of Peace, Honor Anes Swoboda, the Rapporteur of the PRC Subcommittee of Refugees, IDPs, Returnees to the African Union, CSOs present here, development partners, government agencies, representatives from other countries. We have various countries within Africa and Europe that have made it for this conference. We have South Africa, we have Ghana, we have Togo, we have Senegal, we have Mali, Nigeria, South Sudan, Italy, Netherlands. So I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to the fourth international conference on youth and migration. My name is Susan Alupo, and I work with Refugee Law Project as a program manager under the Access to Justice program of the Voices. So allow me, without wasting time, invite the president of the International Institute for Peace to come and give us a few remarks. Good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy that you all came to this uh, conference of a certain type. Of course, especially I want to welcome Your Excellencies, uh, Honorable Minister, Mr. Ambassador, Representative, um, because this speciality, as you saw, yes, it is a conference of experts, but it's a conference of experts who are not only looking at it theoretically, but who could be more an expert on refugee issue than the refugees themselves? That people who were more or less forced to leave the country. And uh, therefore, yes, it is an expert conference, but it is not one where some people teach the others what they should think, but it's a real exchange. And therefore, we keep you as far as possible, of course, ministers has other obligation, but to keep you as possible together these one and a half or two days because we want to come with a result. We Europeans, so to say, often look at uh, migration or at refugees a threat. Oh, they will overrun us, they will come. But we want to elaborate another kind of concept, a concept where of cooperation, of working together how we can solve some of the issues of migration. How can we deal with migration in a different kind than just seeing as a danger, as a threat? And that means that Africa and Europe must find a way of cooperation. How we can help each other, and I say perfectly each other. Because Europe cannot live in peace when there is a big problem in Africa and the other way around. Why did we come to Uganda? We came to Uganda First of all, we have been, some of us have been here two years ago and we found extremely nice people, people helpful, people thinking about the future of this continent. But, and I think the minister uh, will uh, surely develop on that, it is one of the model countries in many respects how they deal with the refugees. It's not easy. There are many more richer countries, bigger problem, with less refugees than Uganda. Does it mean there are no conflicts, no different opinions, no maybe problems here and there? Of course there are. But the way as Uganda is trying to bring people in and trying to convince also its own population that refugees and migration is not a danger, but is a possibility. It gives the country also a chance a challenge, yes, but a chance. That could be a model for many European countries who, seeing, who sees, uh, see the situation with refugees and migration totally different. We want to elaborate a common, let's say, project, a common concept, how Europe and Africa, European countries and African countries, European Union and the African Union, can develop a common concept, especially, of course, concerning 
the younger generation. You, you know perfectly well how many young people will go into the labor market or try to go into a labor market in the coming years. And that is much more than, at least at the moment, jobs are created on this continent. And how we can help to enhance this kind of development is one of the basic idea. You know that uh, at the end of November, there will be the EU African um, Summit, or African EU Summit, as you want it, uh, here in Africa. And uh, one of the main subjects is youth. One of the main subjects the uh, European Union wants to concentrate is how to promote uh, the development for the younger generation in this continent. And I think only a positive attitude in the sense of what can we do together can really bring forward uh, a peaceful managing of uh, migration. We shouldn't have the idea to stop migration. Migration can be helpful in many ways, but it should not be an enforced migration, neither by political problems, by wars, nor by deep economic or ecological problems, if you think about climate change. Therefore, there's a huge task we have to do, and I'm uh, very happy that you all found the way, and I hope that we can find in a real discussion, and finally, also in a common paper, which we want, of course, to distribute on both continents, um, to find ways out of the present stalemate, one accusing the other that they don't do enough to stop migration. Now let's have a common concept of managing migration in a human way. Because if you see some of the concepts where we rely on the traffickers and on the militias, for example, in Libya to stop migration, I don't think is that is a human way. We have to do it in a human way. And I'm particularly uh, proud again that your excellencies came and are uh, opening our conference uh, and I hope we it deserves that you came to this conference when you see the results after that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. I think we've heard from the president of the International, International Institute for Peace. We cannot stop migration, but we can manage it. He's recommending ways in which we can manage migration. Very important and vibrant words there. I would now want to invite um, the rapporteur of PRC, Subcommittee of Refugees, IDPs and Returnees, Lamin, to speak to us. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, moderator. Uh, the Right Honourable uh, uh, Mr. Hennes Swam, Swamboda, member, member, former member of uh, European Parliament, President of the International Institute for Peace, and uh, Right Honourable uh, uh, Cathy Piki, a member of European Parliament, His Excellency the Minister, uh, and also distinguished representatives. Uh, uh, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the subcommittee or of the African Union Permanent Representative Subcommittee on Refugees and Returnees and the Internally Displaced Person, I would like to express my profound gratitude to the organizer for inviting me to this important conference indeed and contribute to discuss on the topical theme of youth and migration. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the government and people of Uganda for the amazing African hospitality extended to all of us since our arrival and say in this, uh, in this beautiful uh, capital of Uganda, Kampala. The issue of immigration and forced displacement is the prominent agenda for, uh, for, for of our time. Migration and displacement is a global phenomenon and priority for society and government in Africa and playing a key role in raising awareness on this topic and discuss the situation and the future of perspective of African youth and identifying their positions and their problems and concerns and most of all, their priority must be welcomed by all of us. As you know, that more than 65 million people are forcibly uh, displaced across the globe 
a far greater number of uh, people are affected by both internal and external migration in one way or another. Africa hosts 12.4 million persons who are internally displaced and 5.6 million refugees and asylum seekers. By all indicators, Africa is also a youthful continent. About 65% of this population is below the age of 35 and more than 35% are between the age of 15 and 35. About 10 million youth, uh, African youth, join the labor market every single year. All these trends put Africa in the heart of linkage between the youth experience and migration. Ladies and gentlemen, if a proper investment are made, Afri African economies will achieve significant gains by fully tackling advantage, taking advantage of the demographic dividends well-educated you, young women and men are the bedrock of economic transformation. They are often inquisitive, energetic, and hopeful. Migration can have a positive impact on young people by opening up new opportunities, access to all forms of education and a job, professional experience, or to pursue personal development by building self-confidence and skills and compet uh, competencies. Forced displacement, however, presents young people with specific risks and challenges. Young people, young, pe young persons who find themselves in a situation of protracted, protracted displacement often have limited access to education, livelihoods, and right to work. Their experience of, of life in limbo often leads to frustration, substance abuses, violence, recruitment by criminal networks, and gangs trafficking since sense of uh, uh, alienation and sometimes extremist and fundamentalist ideologies. In the instigation of violence, particularly women are subject to sexual violence and abuse. Studies also show that young men face specific um, protection risk and challenges. Young refugees and IDPs sometimes may, may be required to take uh, on responsibilities associated with the adulthood at an early age or level or level of uh, ma maturity than was previously the norm in their society. Affecting transformation in gender roles and expectation will have a big influence on lynching the b power of the youth. Young girls too often endure expectation in performance in performing domestic uh, tasks, including collecting ration, water and firewood, cooking, washing clothes, or taking care of the elderly or sick families members and young children. As evidence, suggests this uh, denies young female time to focus on education and other livelihood opportunity, whilst young men are enco encouraged to aspire for job earning, earning living li livelihoods. A study has uh, revealed that, for example, among Somalis refugees in Ethiopia, displacement has resulted in a, l a lengthening of the period of youth for unmarried males. Since uh, a lack of livelihood, opportunity has created a problem for young men in being able to marry. This experience presents difficulty for men to achieve a smooth transition into adulthood, encouraging to, to seek alternatives, avenues which are at time antisocial, violent, and criminal. In countries of asylum, asylum, refugees are often subject to discrimination, xenophobia, racism. We often place our gaze at the experience in, in Western countries. We must acknowledge that these problems occur in Africa countries as well. Many refugees are being subjected to forced, forced return due to uh, suspicious over being involved in terrorist activities or uh, violent extremism. It is, however, important to note that the vast majority of refugees and displaced young are vict victim of terrorism and not its perpet uh, perpetrators. Asylum space should always be open for those who require protection and assistance. Ladies and gentlemen, the African Union has prioritized the issue of youth as a strategic focus. The African Union Assembly decision in January 2016 established the theme for 2017 as harnessing the demographic dividend 
through investments uh, through investments in youth. African Union head of state and government recognize a country level demographic uh, demographic dividend as a central to the continent economy a continent continent economic transformation in the context of African Union agenda 26, uh, 2063. The African Union's global strategy for socio-economic transformation within the next 50 years. The African Union has developed several strategic frameworks, policies, tools to support member states design and implementing practical, uh, practical approaches to unleash the potential of the youth. All these instruments, consistent with the Africa Union Agenda 2063, see the role young people could play as an agent of transformation and positive change. The African Union is working with uh, its partner to contribute to the, to the development of the Global Compact on Refugees and Migration and Migrants that allows a efficient, efficient and improved management of migration and refugees movement in a manner that galvanized management of migration and refugees movement in the manner that gal 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 galvanizes solidarity across the board, taking into account the contribution of refugees and migrants as, cha as, a, as a change agent of the immense burden being carried out, carried by host governments and communities. Let me uh, end uh, my remark by the following. Uh, I would like to conclude my remarks by highlighting the following recommendation. Number one, all actors must support youth initiative programs and community-based organizations that empower the youth. Two, member state humanitarian and development partner and business sectors need to capitalize on the role of technology enhancing in, in, in uh, uh, nursing the potentials of the youth. In this context, more needs to be done in the operationalization technical and vocational and education, educational training, both at the continental, continental and national level. Three, the youth, including those in displacement situation, must be considered as a social group, life stage with particular needs that are distinct from those of younger children and adults while also acknowledging the diversity within the vast category of youth. Four, we must all ensure the involvement of the youth in the designing and implementation of a program by supporting youth initiative activities and community-based organizations that empower the youth. Finally, above all, the international community at large have to have to have approach, have to have a proactive approach and assume its full responsibility in contributing positively to find a durable solution to the issue of migration by tackling its root of causes. May I thank you? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lamin, for those words. I echo the last the international community must have strategies for creating durable solutions to tackle the issue of migration. Without wasting time, allow me to invite the country representative of UNHCR, Mr. Katande Bonwell, to say a word. One thing that I believe is that uh, the youth must design their own programs. Yes. Yeah. It is time for us to let the youth design the interventions that are required. And in Uganda, Honorable Minister, the youth in the settlements are designing their programs. They are demanding from the partners what needs to be done. So as we discuss in the three days, the issue of saving lives, the, li the right to live, must not be forgotten. When you talk about people going to Europe and people dying en route to Europe, each life is precious. So I think that uh, one of the key components that uh, we must always try to ensure that we protect is life. And in the refugee regime, and in Uganda in particular, they have done that regardless of where the people are coming from. And I can attest to that anyone, that everybody that has come to Uganda has not been sent back home. 
The second principle that uh, I would like also us to consider as we look at uh, helping the youth and providing for opportunities for the youth is to ensure that the youth find work. Finding work is different from finding a job. You can find a job and you quit the job not because you, you are not getting money, but you are not connected to the job that you are doing. If the youth find work that connects to their hearts, to their aspirations, they will remain committed to doing that work. And regardless whether they are in Uganda, in Ethiopia, or in Germany. And we need to help the youth to connect to the work that they need to do. And to do so, we need to listen to them. We need to listen to them so that they make those choices and we support them in those choices as they ensure that they can support themselves and support their families. We should also, I think, remember that those who pay others to take them to Europe, they pay more than what a plane can cost them. A plane is cheaper, they pay more and sometimes pay with their lives. So the African Union, I think, must look at this aspect. Why can't the youth just go for holiday and come back, and then they can say, I have been to Europe, it's cold. <laughs> or, I have been to this location, it's not as it used to be told. Let's not make it that uh, unknown. Let me give you a practical example. In Uganda, Refugees are allowed freedom of movement. They can go where they want to go. Are they all in Kampala? The answer is no. Because if they want to come to Kampala, they can come for a short time to their business and go back to their location where they are doing their work. I have colleagues that are coming from the settlement. They can tell you their own experiences. But I want to assure the African Union to assure you that uh, giving people freedom of movement does not mean that they will go where you don't want them to go. Actually, if you stop them from moving, they are curious to go outside. <laughs> so the solution is not about uh, protecting people from moving, but making it easy. i give you another example. Thank you. i give you an example. We are all entitled to documentation, including passports in our countries. But not every Ugandan has a passport. But he's entitled to, right? Not even every American has a passport. They only use it when they need it. So we should apply and ensure that we do not get the youth to think of maybe I should go to Italy. Or if I go to Italy, then I'll be okay. Give them a chance, those who want to go on holiday to Italy, to go on holiday to Italy, come back. They can afford it. So I, I'm arguing for the youth, because the youth, they can afford to travel. The youth are curious. Let us not kill their curiosity, because we think they will not go back home. I come from Malawi, and I have two young boys, one grandson. They all dream of going back to Malawi. And I, as I work for the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, one day I go back home. Not because they chase me from Uganda and it's not a good place to live, but that's where I belong. <laughs> so I think that we need to provide the youth that connection to their country. And to be able to say, I was born in Uganda, but I am Sudanese. I was born in Uganda, but I was in Malawi. And the African Union must make it easier for people to choose where they can live if they can afford it. The youth are a resource that we need to build on for the sake of the continent and for the sake of the world. We cannot build the youth only by having a certain percentage that are going to school. Everybody must go to school. Let's equalize the area. African Union, you are very good at getting children to school, but there are less children going to school now. Even when we have freedom, 
to the uh, university of education in our settlements we not even reach 90% mm. i would like to go 100% so then let us focus on ensuring that the youth are equipped let us ensure that the youth design their own programs in the settlement in the countries and that uh, we ask them as being responsible youth to be able so to provide that comfort to the adults to, to us that we can leave you to do things sometimes you don't give us that comfort that's why we we, we, we check on you but if you are you are given responsibility I can assure you no one will be going on those bad journeys and I will be talking tomorrow specifically on Uganda because Uganda is not a assisting refugees out of fear. It's not assisting refugees out of checking who is a, a good one, who is not a good one. They are providing the right to life, the right to seek asylum, and the right for them to develop and to grow while they are here in Uganda. And I think Uganda is the front line if you are talking about migration. And if they can make it in Uganda, they can make it in Kenya. Let us make sure that we provide the policies that help the youth make it in where they are. I thank you for giving the chance to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Katande, the country representative of UNHCR. I think one thing he says is that uh, youth must design their own programs. And I think all the youth in this house agree. Do you agree? The youth must design their own programs. Programs should not be designed for the youth to implement. That is a very good recommendation. I would now want to invite the State Minister. For I want to first thank the Honorable Members of Parliament who are here and thank the distinguished guests who are in this panel and all of you comrades in this very special platform today. I consider it very special and therefore, I had a written speech by technical people. But since I'm not technical, I'm going to speak from the heart. And I want you to pardon me because it has always been my nature for those who have worked with me for many years to speak frankly and very honestly from my heart. First of all, I speak as a minister in Uganda responsible for the management of over 1.3 million people, the refugees. 1.3 million people. Those are the people I serve. And I have always said, wherever I have been, that the job of a refugee manager is slightly more than a job, it's a calling. Ours is slightly more than a job, it's a calling because it is our duty to wipe the tears of these colleagues, friends, who are being reduced to sometimes very inhuman conditions by circumstances beyond their control. So among many things that we do is to wipe their tears. Among many things that we do is to repair their hearts. Among many things that we do is to give them hope. And whenever I have had a chance to speak to my brothers and sisters from DR Congo, from Sudan, I tell them, one day you'll go back home, and that one day will come. And you never must, never lose your hope while here. That's one. Two, I also have to make it abundantly clear, particularly to us friends who come from Europe, that uh, the word refugee is not synonymous to criminal. The word refugee is not synonymous to criminal. The world has let down the refugees because they think when they see refugees, they have seen criminals. To me, a minister responsible for this 1.3 million people, refugees represent their victims of a dysfunctional global system. <laughs> refugees are victims 
of a dysfunctional global system. And therefore, I'm not going to speak about refugees from Syria, from all those other parts of the world. Allow me to speak about African refugees, particularly the youth and the ones I know I have been dealing with for close to a decade. I've been around, as you will learn with time. One, these African refugees, these African youth are at crossroads. To their ears, they are being told about their planet, about their continent, Africa. They are being told Africa is a continent of hope. They have been told Africa represents the richest continent now remaining in the planet. Minerals have been discovered. There is promise. Africa represents promise. That's what has been fed to the youth and the ears of the African youth. But in the eyes of the African youth, they see hunger, they see famine, they see death, they see recruitment into uh, you know, systems that they don't quite understand. So the youth in Africa are at crossroads. They promise we, the leaders in the continent, are telling them that your continent is a destination, is a place of hope, is everywhere now because with global, uh, the, the, uh, dwindling global resources, Africa is perceived to represent now those resources that are untapped. But that is what is fed to the ears of the youth. But what is fed to the eyes of the youth is different. The young men see death. These young people, each one of them has a testimony that is extremely chilling. I, 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 I want to tell you, friends who are here, like I told you in my opening remarks, that the job, the work of a minister responsible for refugees in Africa and in Uganda in particular is a calling. Many times I go beyond just being a minister and these young people come to my office and give me testimonies. So among the things that I do is counseling to cancel them and tell them not all is lost. So what is the problem of Africa? The biggest problem that I want to honestly tell you is the governance question. The biggest challenge of the continent is the governance question. Countries that were very progressive yesterday have over the years degenerated to becoming fragile states and some of them unfortunately have become completely failed states. Unless and until we fix the governance question, this question of people running out of their wonderful parts of the world will never be stopped. So the governance question. The emergence of people in Africa who are suppressive and occupying positions of responsibility has led to the emergence of warlords again and wars that are difficult to manage. The wars that we fought many years ago to ask you to leave Africa, you from Europe, those wars of liberation had some definition. But the wars of today are not even defined. I, I, have, I, have, I have spoken to young people from DR Congo, and I'm happy their representative is here, and then they tell me what is happening in Ruchuru, they tell me what is happening in Beni, and it is, you can't imagine that these testimonies are testimonies of actions that are happening in this century. When we thought we had the fired satellites into the air and we are now going to monitor a lot of things as the global society and be able to do a number of things very efficiently in tandem with our civilization. That has been compromised. So the governance challenge is a big problem. With the governance, poor governance in the continent, systems have collapsed. And with the collapse of systems, a number of things, apart from just violence associated with either repressive regimes or non-state actors, we have a situation where we are visited now by challenges of economic mismanagement. Challenges of economic mismanagement. Every youth has hope. And I speak as a parent. The rep was talking about having three children, three boys, and for me, as a Ugandan, I went for quite a number. <laughs> uh, and uh, and I, if you ask me how many, it's not allowed in Uganda to, to disclose the number of children, just in case 
you, you forget the number. <laughs> then it becomes a problem because they will cross check and then they will remind you, but you said you are, we are eight, but I thought we are ten. Yeah. So, 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 so we are careful in Uganda not to, but I have many. Now, when I, when, when I look at my sons, uh, and they are very handsome, interestingly. When, when I look at my sons and I, and I see their hope and I see their aspirations, then I go to my refugee camps and I see their age mates in distress, in pain, being subjected to all sorts of inhuman treatment. I imagine what would happen if my son had those kind of shoes. That's what bothers me. If my is lucky mine that the country is stable where I am and then the father is a minister, but is my son is as intelligent, as brilliant as that South Sudanese who now has no chance of going to school. But this South Sudanese is a victim of a failed system. A victim of a failed system and that's why he finds himself in that position. So economic degeneration that has led our people to be uprooted from their once very lovely countries. When you talk about, look at Zimbabwe. As a young man growing up in Uganda, there was a time if you wanted to buy a house in Uganda, you either went to Nairobi or Harare. That was the destination. But that the economy of Zimbabwe can be brought to its knees and cause the young people to run to South Africa. And then in South Africa, they find their colleagues who are black like them in the institution. And they are, for those black in South Africa, start looking at their colleagues from Zimbabwe as those who have grabbed the opportunities. And hence, xenophobia. That's xenophobia. We in Uganda, and I'm happy that the rest rep is here, much as we know there are problems around us, we have rejected xenophobia. We have rejected xenophobia as a country. We have rejected criminalization of groups. And, 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 and if, for example, you want to, you know, so if you have been following developments here, there was a situation here where we were bombed when we were watching World Cup as it was concluding in South Africa. It turned out the people who bombed us were criminals of Somali origin. But they did not do it on behalf of Somalis. So there was a risk of us rounding up over 200 and so Somali refugees now in the country if it was a disorganized system. But we rejected criminalization of the entire group and went and picked the suspect and criminals and left those who are innocent to continue pursuing their lives. That is what has made a difference here. Today, because of the displacement associated with all the things that I have indicated to you, I've indicated the governance, I've indicated, of course, economic decay, there is one other challenge. This huge animal called climate change, this huge animal called climate change, it has its ramifications. And unfortunately, when it rears its ugly head, the poorest are the first to feel it. The poorest feel it more. You know, we have had a flood in Houston. And I can tell you, unfortunately, we, we are, we are also resting in feet, about 47 people may have died of 49. But if such a flood happened in Malawi, if such a flood happened here in Kampala, even some ministers would have died. <laughs> I am telling you. That is how difficult it is in our situation of an so when climate change rears it is ugly head, the biggest victims are poor underdeveloped people. And therefore, Africans, young boys and girls who would want to enjoy their villages and their rural areas get uprooted. And in doing that, they have been told that Europe is a place of promise. Again, they have been told that it is easy in Europe. And because of the unpalatable conditions home, they are forced to attempt to cross to Europe at all costs. And that's where the Mediterranean Sea today has become the biggest graveyard of our time. The Mediterranean Sea is the biggest graveyard of our time. And my appeal, recently I was in Copenhagen, the international community has a responsibility to fix the problem first. Forget about why we are dealing with the governance and a number of challenges in Africa. We must fix the problem of trafficking along the Libyan and all those coasts. And I, I want to ask you, my friends from Europe, when you people help to remove Gaddafi, 
you should have known the consequences. Yes. You help to remove Gaddafi. I'm not saying I am an apologist of Gaddafi, but to remove Gaddafi without plan B is the biggest mistake of our time. We should have removed Gaddafi and put in place plan B. Today, Gaddafi was a dictator, but at least the slave traders were not in Libya. We have so many people now. Slave trade is back. It is back in a different form. There are young people who are lured into Europe, that we are going to Europe with a lot of promise. And the merchants who are doing this are from this failed state called Libya. And, and the international community has a responsibility, working with NGOs at, to fix the policing of the Mediterranean Sea. I am supposed to be a strong man, my friend. I'm supposed to be a strong man, and those who are Ugandans know I am not supposed, my tears are not supposed to be seen, even by my wife. But each time I watch CNN and I see a rickety boat sinking and sinking with black, black people, my heart, I have to ask, excuse myself from the sitting room and go and weep in my room because I don't want my people to know that I'm human. <laughs> they must know that I'm still a tough man. To go and weep in my room when I see a boat carrying black people sinking and black people who volunteer to board the boat they volunteered because they thought there is hope across. I wrote an article, those of you follow some of my articles, I wrote an article here when that young boy was swept. There was a young boy from Syria who went to Turkey and then he lost his mother and so he was swept by the currents back, smart shoes and everything and was the age of my young boy. And I said, it could have been my son. It could have been my son. The world as failed refugees. The world must sort out itself. And by the world, I mean all of us. That's why when I hear you experts are here, I am going to come tomorrow and the next day to do a lot of listening. I want to pick your minds on what options are available for us to fix this non-functional system. What actions? I hear so much now in your part of the world, in Europe, in the US, I hear big pronouncements by leaders in government. Big pronouncement. And I thank leaders. You leaders, all of us must make big pronouncement. But big pronouncement must be realistic. <coughs> Finally, and this is my final. Refugees and displacement. First of all, the testimonies, yes, I said are chilling. The Mediterranean Sea, you know, there is this program that was called the Nansen Initiative. I, I participated in some of its discussions. There was this Eritrean girl. This Eritrean girl came and testified to us, and I guess that's why some of these refugees will not want to speak in camera. But I can say what she said. I'm a girl. We were told that we can cross the Red Sea, cross into it through Yemen, and go for better opportunities in Saudi Arabia. But we also told that as you cross, you are likely to be raped several times. So even before we left Asmara, as girls were to take pills because we didn't want to get pregnant on the way. Even as we left Asmara, we had to take pills because we didn't want to get pregnant. We knew we were going to be raped severally as we walked to Saudi Arabia and those other parts of the world. How can this happen in this century? And we are all here. What is sad development? How can it happen in this century? And we're all here. The future is not totally hopeless, but it's bad. Fix governance, address climate change, address a number of things, and make migration easy and possible. Make migration easy and possible so that people are not forced to go to options that are dangerous. That is my position. And I want to thank you so much for your very kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. I think we need to go to the next session. And I would like to invite Bella, Yusuf, Diakite, Simon, Tulong. I don't know if I've pronounced the names well. So we've had very wonderful words. I now want to hear from the youth.
We want to hear the experiences. They'll speak to us about the experiences being here in Uganda. So allow me to invite Bella. Just share your experience within 10 minutes. Good afternoon once again. Burundian refugee living in Kampala. I'm married and I'm, I have been appointed women refugee of the year 2017. I'm here to share with you my experiences. I have fled my country six years ago because of the political instability which was in my country. My husband, this happened because my husband was a strong supporter of the opposition party, which campaigned against the current president. Crossing the border was not easy, and I was also pregnant. I reached here in Uganda. Reaching here in Uganda, I went to settlement in Akivale, Western Uganda. Today, a home to about 36 Burundian refugees among other nationalities. Yes, yes, 36,000. After years of political instabilities in the country. However, quickly I realized that I was far from safe when I notified Secret Service agent from Burundi, whom came to my home looking for my husband. What I did, I reported to the police officers, but in vain. I came to Kampala. The next month, it was in August, the next month I gave birth. It was a sad experience ever. I didn't know English, and it was very difficult to communicate to doctors and nurses. Sorry. After that, I was alone with my baby. And fortunately, I found my family, my husband and my stepchildren. We were about 12, whereby it was difficult to manage the life. And you know how children, they behave. Sometimes they don't want to hear. Despite the critical condition that you are as a parent, you have to see how you can fulfill their right. My husband couldn't do anything apart from hiding. As a mother, I couldn't sit at home. I had to try my best. I had to work morning to evening to see that I can provide something for my family. I went, I remember I went, my baby was sick. And I went to seek services to health centers here in Kampala. I don't want to talk about that health center. But when I was explaining, a doctor told me to pay, to give him some money, which I didn't have. And I told him that I, knew, I know that services are for free of charge. But he became harsh to me, telling me that if I want free services, I have to go back to my country. Also, one of my friends was going to give birth to Mulago Hospital, which even her faced the same problem. When I saw that, I said that no, we have to be strong. We have to be, to do something as refugees so that people can come to know that even refugees, we can do better than other people. I went to Refugee Law Project and inter to learn English so that I can be the voice of the voiceless. I was graduated and I started volunteering myself despite all the challenges that I was facing through. I said, no, it's time to do something for my fellow refugees. 
outcomes to those who doesn't know everything. But for us, we, been, we get the chance from our country to be educated. But it doesn't mean that reaching here to the country of Islam, we can just sit there. I started volunteering myself for my communities, not only for Burundian community, but also other refugees, because they were facing the same challenges that I was facing. I realized that my community members, they were facing more, many challenges. Trauma was there. They were stressed of the life, no job. And I, I, I saw that if we are continuing sitting at home, just comparing the life that we are facing here in Kampala and the ones that we left behind, we are not going anywhere. I went to GRS, Jesuit Refugee Council. I wrote a letter for having some skills in entrepreneurship skills, whereby we have been granted that training. We were 12 women Burundian refugees, but nine of us completed that training. We started making necklaces, start jewelries, fabric, Bitenge of Tayendai, whereby we started hawking around in this road of Kampala. But life was not easy. To find the market was difficult. Sometimes we were discriminated and, and they were taking our, our products without paying because we didn't have how to defend ourselves. And what I said, I said that no, we cannot just let people taking our products and we sit. We have to speak out. I didn't stop from that. I, on that time, I was really hopeless. My children was asking me, when going back to our country? I tried my best to see that I can educate the children. And good enough, I thank God that I tried my best. And even now, my children are studying. I got a training of peer counselors at Refugee Law Project to see that I can be, that training can be helpful to the community. And really, I thank Refugee Law Project because once I had some cases, they always, whenever I refer those cases, they always help the community members. I really appreciate it. That one was not even there. But I saw that even that counseling that I'm providing to these refugees, it is not really relevant because counseling, when we are getting counseling, we need even financial support, which was not there. I saw that whatever I'm doing, volunteering to facilities, peer counseling was not relevant. I got an opportunity of applying to a scholarship from Window Trust which I was granted, and that scholarship was not for me, it was for the community. I saw that refugees, not only refugees, but especially refugees, we are facing a lot of diseases, whereby our, ourselves we could prevent it. But because of the life that we are living, because of the congested area we are living, which gives us those diseases, and sometimes our poor living condition also. I said, no, let me do this public health whereby I could help my communities to prevent for those diseases, especially young girls and women. We are struggling to see that we can be role model, but sometimes at, the, at the time we fail to provide something to our daughters. Having that scholarship was not, I didn't stop from that. Until now I'm studying, I'm second year in public health. I saw at school, when I was at school, I saw a young lady. She was studying, but she didn't know that her aunt was paying her tuition through a man who could marry her without her concern? Imagine. When the, that lady found out, she said, no, I have to achieve my dreams. 
but unfortunately, the aunt didn't want to hear that, and the aunt disappeared. When I, I found that I felt bad, I came back to my love that I've been passing through. I'm having daughters on those, these critical conditions that we are living. If I can start selling my children, what will be their future? I went to see to Window Trust if there were any opportunity around so that this young girl could continue studying. Fortunately, she got that scholarship now she's studying. But despite all that, those things, I want to tell you that being a refugee sometimes, it makes us feel bad. It makes us, because when we are looking for the host community, yes, for the people, for the high people, they understand the fact of refugees, but the, the host community doesn't understand. Sometimes they tell us that we are the one making things worsening. Imagine renting a room whereby we are leaving 12 people inside. Then the landlord starting telling you that now you are men in the house, you have to pay this amount. Or sometimes saying that you are the one making all those bad things to us. It's better you go back to your countries. How can you feel? People are dying. There are many in numbers. I myself have experienced death of people. My fellow refugees is dying. Because I always go to ask, to ask support for burying people. Can you imagine? If I, ha I could have that ability, I could save life. People are dying. People, youth, they are not going to school. We found this mirror group to see that we can give hope to these young youth. We are using our culture, entrepreneurship skills, any skills that anyone has to see that people, this youth, they can have hope. But um, I, I was glad to hear the spe your speeches. It really give, give me hope. But I wish if we could all these words that we are saying here, we could put into practices. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bella, for sharing your experiences. I know it's not always easy for someone to share the experiences but Bella we thank you so much for having shared your experience with everyone here and uh, <laughs> we've worked with Bella she's, she's a client of the refugee law project so we've worked closely with her and uh, we now want to invite Yusuf Diakite who is the chairperson, African Youth Diaspora in Europe. You're welcome. Thank you. I don't know how to start after this uh, <laughs> at moment. <laughs> My name is Yusuf. I'm Malian, living in Austria. My story is completely different from uh, her story because uh, uh, I was born in Mali, raised there, and um, I even had the chance to go to the university study in Mali or business uh, management and then I got the job uh, I work for EcoBank which is a, a very well-known bank in Africa for five years and um, what happened during these five years as uh, I had a good job that uh, my friend didn't have and meeting and I was always uh, facing some small discrimination because I studied in Mali because I couldn't get some position at the, at the work because uh, once somebody were coming from US or America, they would get quickly a better position because they maybe study better than you. And those story was bothering me for a long, long time. And uh, one day I was thinking, I said, hey, I have an opportunity to go to Europe, maybe to study further and to come back. Maybe I will become the director of my bank. Who knows? Um, the first opportunities I have was uh, to, to fly to Austria as a student. 
and uh, many of my family say, why are you going to Europe? I say, yeah, because uh, on the TV I'm seeing nice thing, you know, opportunities. Maybe after I can compete with, uh, you know, the Golden Boys, getting better position, you know, I had a big dream. And uh, yes, uh, I went to Austria. When I arrived uh, to Austria, I realized that, uh, oh, things are not going to be easy here because the first time I was there, I said, wow, I became a black. I wasn't any more used to that. I used to wear nice clothes, meeting nice people. I became a black guy. And then um, I decided to go to try to make sure that my diploma from Mali will be recognized. It. And uh, at the end of the day, I realized that I'm an unskilled person. Couldn't get any job after, you know, all my potential and everything. And I uh, started looking for a small job to survive, which wasn't easy. And one of the most important factors in uh, German-speaking countries is the language, because you have to pay to go to the German class phase before st even starting your study, which wasn't an easy thing, because being on um, maybe where three, four black people in my university, and even seeing somebody to whom we can discuss, you know, having a normal friend wasn't uh, really easy. We decided to be in a community to create a an organization, an African student organization, to try to help each other, which uh, was similar to I saw what she was saying. Why we came to this point? Because even some time in Europe, to have a place, you are living in Europe to sleep. You need to sleep with an old woman or old man to find yourself. This is a true reality of Europe nowadays. As African going there, you cannot have a normal friend. Sometimes you have to find your way. How the ladies are doing, they are staying with the old woman most of the time. And we say we want to change this. We develop some project, and we said as well we are studying where we never had a chance to do internship here. Which skill are we taking back home if we are just working, black work, you know, getting some small money, you know, staying at the university for no, with no experience and others. We decided to to create this accommodation program for six months for African students, which was a, a successful program. And we uh, achieved to help uh, more than 60 African really to get the degree, because I will tell you the truth, in, in Europe, less than 10% of African students nowadays are getting really the diploma because of the financial uh, issues and others. And uh, when we started doing that, we started having small community going to the university, studying together. And the, the, the things we are trying now to do with Africa most of the time is to make sure that our brothers will have a, a mobility program to see around. Like uh, you were saying, it's very important to see before deciding going. Because the day I left my country, I started regretting why I did that. I cannot come back because the, my family are waiting for me to help my other sisters and brothers. To, to be in Europe, to have a great diploma, to come back home. And then I left as well because of uh, there is no volunteering program in Africa. Those things are very important for us young people. To go to see, to have some volunteering program, to, to make sure that there is some mobility program for us. Otherwise, whatever we'll have, we want more. We want to go because we are looking for more perspectives for, for hope. Like you are the refugees or you are a normal young African you want to have a better life, like we say, and you want to be the most important. You want to share the same dream that a young American is sharing with everybody, working for the World Bank, you know, the big institutions. And then what happened to us now, after my second master program in, in Vienna, we're starting to organize ourselves to make sure that our brothers and our sisters will be linked to them in Africa in terms of employability, in terms of entrepreneurship, which take me uh, took me three months ago to Kampala again and uh, to try to see with 40 other African diaspora trying to be linked to Africa to have a joint venture program to work with them to share our experience because all the people I know some want to go as well but we want to come back to Africa like you said because they told us that the perspective is all in Africa and we can't see it what we are trying to do as well is to have or those partnerships where maybe somebody from here can bring the knowledge of the country and uh, the how business is going and we can bring the knowledge we have or money sometimes to 
try to promote really those kind of activities. What are we doing as well each year? We had a chance now because the organization became interesting from a student organization to a European wide organization. And we organized two times per year big conferences where we invited many entrepreneurs in Africa, about 170, to come to meet European companies, to meet African diaspora. We want to come back home and do business. And nowadays we become very successful. But the story behind that, when I went to Europe, wasn't to work for diaspora or my community, but because of the need, uh, because of the study I've been doing, now I'm just working for the community, doing community work. Why? Because this is only the way for us you know, to wake up in the morning to say that we are doing something for ourselves, for our community. And it's so hard. There is so many programs going on right now in, in Europe. But to go back home is so difficult for us right now. Of course, there is a lot of program, but I don't know which one is working well. I applied myself for many grants from European side to open an incubation center in Mali, and we didn't achieve. But through my personal connection and some support from Austria side, we achieved last year to, to, to open our own places. And uh, now we have uh, about... Uh, 15 companies, you know, working with international experts because why I left the country was because I wanted to be one of the best. Now what I'm doing is trying inviting best professor from US, from Europe, to be the mentor of those young people in Mali and to help them. But this is partially the solution. And what we are doing, we have a lot of activities. Once somebody is able to run his company, we are inviting the person as well to see Europe because or US because we need this to see it. It's important to see it and how can we see it and come back home is the biggest challenges we have right now. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much Yusuf for sharing your experience and for the great work you're doing in Austria. I now want to invite Christine who is a refugee from South Sudan. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for this opportunity. My name is Christine James, South Sudanese Fiji. I'm a learner at Rivigi Lower Project. I would like to talk about three points concerning these programs. The first is about refugees. As a refugee here in Uganda, we have a lot of problems we face. Number one, we don't have good treatment when we are sick. Sometimes when a person is sick, it's not treated very quickly. And even when they send you government hospitals, they don't give you all medicine and you are told to buy the rest. And yet we don't have money to do that. Number two, the organization do not take care for refugees the way they should. For example, when people go to camp, they delay to register people and serve food late. And even sometimes, they register people by money. If the organization should are really responsible, for refugees. How comes when we ask for help, you do not treat us the way you should? The organization should provide the schools for younger children and also teachers to give them good foundation. Because if the children are not given good foundation, they will suffer in future, like how we are suffering now. The organization should provide learning lessons for Luganda to make communication easy between us and them. For example, now at Drift Europe Project, they provide for us English class. Now I can speak English. I'm not perfect, but I can speak because 
the time when I came from Sudan, I don't know any language, just one. I know Arabic because I were studying Arabic. The second is about use. As we use here in Uganda, we don't have programs to encourage us. Our voice is not heard. No fees for us to join university. And we are mistreated by other people. Finally, the Chinese. Many refugees, they return back to their country because they were suffering. They were not given good treatment. They don't have house to stay in. They don't have enough food. They don't have the school. They went back to look for their children. Also, I want to thank the government of Uganda for the opportunity they gave us to stay inside town. Because in other country, countries, they are not allowed refugees to stay in the town. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Christine, for sharing your experiences. We now want to watch a brief documentary. Three minutes was to initiate a radio station, an FM station in West Nile. I had the opportunity to be like in this a similar forum in Toronto, Canada. Then uh, after my address, some people from the platform came and asked me, what can we do for us to work with the communication? So I told them, why don't you help me establish a radio station that can be specifically used by refugees to promote dialogue and peace? So they donated that radio. I never, Uganda never paid a cent. And now there is a radio of Usalama. Those of you who know a bit of Kiswahili, Usalama means peace. So there is a radio Usalama in Ajumani. And the last time I was with the bishops of South Sudan, I invited them and I want to invite these young men and women to come over to the radio and speak because it is picked in most parts of Juba. I mean South Sudan and most parts of Northern Uganda and parts of DR Congo. And uh, we are working around the clock to expand this uh, network so that the whole of South Sudan will be within the network. So Radio Salama is available and, and you will be speaking on it for free. There will be no charge and, and, and it will be very good to hear, particularly from young people like you. And I want to happily report to you there's, there's been a very huge inter, you know, support from the international community to ask, ask to help the host communities together with the refugees. So the classrooms that you are talking about, the teachers, are things that are coming. I can quote one organization with authority here, JICA. This is one of the development arms of the Japanese government. JICA is coming in a big way to help us fix classrooms in the refugee camps and settlements and also to do some roads. And I can assure you, when that is done, we should be able to absorb most of the refugee children together with the host community so that the hosts don't see like the refugees are benefiting at their expense. So those are the, some of the things I will do. Tomorrow when I come, I can give you a litany of some of the interventions and proposals <laughs> so that you people know that, yes, we know there are challenges, but we also appreciate that there are things that we are trying to do to fix this problem. Now, this one of corruption, sometimes asking you, the truth is that we still have corrupt Ugandans, like there is corruption in most parts of the world. Even me, minister, when they don't know that I'm a minister, they sometimes ask me, for the, the only thing that helps me, the only thing that helps me is you can see me arriving like a minister because of the surrounding, the people who move with me. So you may not ask for a bribe, but if they didn't know, they would actually ask for a bribe. It's unfortunate. It is a problem that we must fight. Corruption is real. And we appreciate that you can speak about it openly so that we can see how to address it. But, but uh, I, I am happy that it's not a hopeless case, although it is a bad case. Yeah, thank you. And there will be a lot of discussions. I think the discussion should not be limited to this room. When you are having your dinner, when you are having your tea, the discussions should go on. And I wanted just to say one more thing. I come from a village. And in the villages, Honorable Minister, 
when a, a husband has died or the mother has died and you have children that need somebody, the person that takes care of those children is that poor auntie who lives in one bedroom house, has nothing and has m her own five children, right? But she I remember her sending one of our elder brothers. He went and fell sick and nearly died. He came back home, luckily without anything. But we wanted to go. And our father say, had to say one, two words. He said, I'm giving you two words. Stay home. Stay home and stay home. So the question is, we have issues, we have problems at home in Africa. What can we do to make sure we stay home? How can we resist all temptations whatsoever that can force us out? It's a shame that we, we, we agree to sacrifice our life overseas. We're seen as the symbol of suffering and pain and hopelessness. Yet we have everything within here. This is the time that let us demand as young Africans, as young refugees, as host communities in Uganda, demand there's a lot of resources within humanitarian intervention. UNHCR is here. Ministry in charge of disaster preparedness is here. We have those resources, the fund that comes in. Why is that we have to keep buying the food to supply refugees in Uganda from America, from Europe, yet we have land fertile land in Uganda that can be supported to young people to grow food locally so that the money, as they are hosting the communities, refugee hosting become rewarding. This is what we should look at. This is what we should work around and make sure that we, 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 we succeed. Finally, thank you so much, the UNHCR and the minister again for agreeing to be here throughout the process. In most cases, we have a challenge where leaders come and listen. Peep, run away, they're never there, so they don't get everything. But we are happy that you have committed. You're going to stay for the next few days. Thank you so much.